So in the first parts of this lecture, we discussed what the instruction set architecture is, and we just showed how we invoke a procedure. But now we're going to go into the next part, which is how we run a program, the call process, or compiling, assembling, linking, and loading. So let's start with the general compilation process. What we're going to do is convert source code in some sort of high-level language, and we're going to turn it into some binary, an executable binary, that is in machine code. Okay, so the first point is that we need to compile it. So we take some high-level language, as we see here, a couple of files in high-level language, C or C++, in the example, and we compile them into an object file. So we compiled these into an object file. However, what we're usually going to have is several files that we made together. Some of them may have directly been written in assembly, for example, and then we need to combine them into one single object file, which we do by using a linker or linking together um, these guys. Uh, and, and after we have a linked file, a linked object file, what we need to do is take the um, relative addresses and turn them into absolute addresses, which will actually point to memory um, addresses on our hardware, and that we do with a relocating table, and, a, and we um, provide an executable, a binary, that we can actually go and load and run on the hardware. I just want to mention one more term, which is called cross-compilation. So often what we do is we compile some code on one system, such as Windows or, uh, or Mac OS or maybe Linux, and we actually want to run that code on a different platform, such as an embedded system that's running an ARM or a RISC-V or something like that, ISA. And so we call that cross-compilation when we compile software in one system, which we call the host, that is intended for running on a different pr platform, which is called the target. So let's go over the steps in compiling and running such a high-level program. So um, we see it over here, and this is going to escort us in the next few slides. And we'll start with a C file called foo.c, and we're going to invoke the GCC compiler, which is one of the open source standard well-known compilers, the GNU compiler. So we're going to take as an input a high-level language um, program that we wrote. In this case, we wrote it in C, and we used the minus C flag. So foo.c is a C program or some other high-level language code. We're going to uh, push it through the compiler, and the compiler is going to output an assembly language code with a, usually uh, with a dot uh, S um, extension. Okay, the output is going to be an assembly language code, which is not going to be directly the ISA. It may have some pseudo instructions, but it's going to be very close to what uh, the instructions we know from our ISA. After we have that um, code uh, that is in assembly language, we are going to take an assembler. An assembler is a program that takes the input um, assembly language, the foo.s file, and it turns it into an object file, which is actual machine language. So it's binary numbers, zeros and ones and so forth. And this is called object code and includes some information tables and so forth. It reads and uses directives. It replaces pseudo instructions with, with actual instructions and produces real machine language. The object file is usually in the ELF or the COF format. Those are some of the common formats used for object code. However, we have what we call the processor memory map. So at this point, our memory locations are going to be something that is relative. And actually, in our processor, we're going to have a map that divides the whole memory space into different areas. And in this very, very simple example from Patterson and Hennessy's book, we have some area that's reserved, some area called the text, some area called the static data, dynamic data, and the stack. So let's briefly go over some of these. So the actual program code is going to be usually um, placed in addresses that are reserved for what is called the text area. Then we have the static data area. That is an area in our address space that is going to be used to store global variables and static variables, constants, um, such as strings, and so forth. So um, that's an area that we can just go and use some sort of a pointer, the global pointer, that is going to point to some point in, uh, in the memory space. And we can just use offsets from there to go and access these global variables or, um, or these constants. Then we have what we call the dynamic data. The dynamic data is the heap. When we use a uh, command like malloc in C or new in Java, we're going to allocate 
some da data dynamically, and that's going to, in this example, it's going to be allocated from bottom up in the memory space, um, from the end of the static data over here, going up until it never ends. On the other side, we're going to start from the end of the memory space in this example and define the base of the stack. And the stack is going to grow down in this place. And as we saw already, we're going to allocate another stack frame for each and every one of the functions that we um, call. Okay? One problem is that this is not infinite, even though it should be infinite. And therefore, the dynamic data and the stack data can meet each other. And that is a stack overflow. And that is something we don't want to happen. That is when we run out of memory and everything crashes. So let's continue our compilation. And after we have our foo.o object file, we're going to go and link it. So we have other files. Maybe we um, took several files that we compiled separately and we want to combine them together. Or maybe we wanted to use libraries that were pre-compiled for us, such as something like printf or something like that. So for that, we take um, as the input several object files, as we can see here, a foo file and a lib file. And what we're going to do is we're going to stick them into a linker, which is going to merge them into one object file. So this a.o over here is a single object file that combines all the machine code that we had in foo.o and, uh, and lib.o and other files. Okay, this enables us to really change a single file uh, without recompiling the whole program. So, for example, Linux source code has over 20 million lines of code. If we had to recompile everything every time, that would be a big deal. Instead, we can just recompile parts of it and relink them. So, once we have the, the linked file, then we need to um, locate the or relocate all the data. So, inside the a.o file, we have relative addresses or labels and so forth that tell us where, uh, what the different types of uh, um, um, addresses should be. And the linker script will go and tell us about the memory space, how it is allocated in our specific machine. And then uh, um, the locator will go and replace those relative addresses with real addresses. And we can produce a binary executable that we can go and load into our memory and run the computer. So a, another point is about static versus dynamically linked libraries. What we discussed above is the traditional way. In other words, we're using a statically linked approach. That means we went and we took all of the files and we put them into one single executable that had all the um, addresses, the absolute addresses, where they should sit inside the memory space. So the library is now actually part of the executable. We compiled it and linked it into the same um, executable as the rest. If, for example, we update the library, we won't have that. We'll have to recompile our whole, um, our whole program to get the update, or we just won't have the fix at all. Um, it also includes the entire library, and every single one of our executables will have the entire library, which could be redundant and so forth. However, this executable is self-contained, and therefore, often with embedded systems, this is what we do. We want to provide one piece of program code that will have everything inside of it. That is not the way it works with um, bigger systems, such as Windows and Unix platforms and so forth. They use DLLs, dynamically linked libraries. In this case, there is a loader that dynamically links the functions at runtime. So once we come and take some sort of a library or some sort of a file, it may go and provide it with addresses. It will load it into the address space. And then it will update the um, places that we have to look at those libraries from the functions that want to call it. In that way, we only have to have a single copy of the um, library inside the memory. We don't have to have each program that uses it have its own uh, copy of it. And we can really have only the, the certain libraries that we want to use instead of um, taking all of the uh, libraries that are available and loading them into memory already at the beginning. 